My name is Colin Dever. Uh, I'm a PhD student in early Christianity uh, here in Duke University's graduate program in religion. Uh, and I'm actually serving as the, the president of the Duke chapter of the Thomistic Institute for this academic year. Uh, the Thomistic Institute, based out of the Dominican House of Studies in Washington, D.C., exists to promote Catholic truth in our contemporary world by strengthening the intellectual formation of Christians at universities, in the church, and in the wider public square. The Institute sponsors lectures and conferences in Washington, D.C., New York City, and on college campuses across the country. The thought of St. Thomas Aquinas, the universal doctor of the church, is our touchstone. Please sign the sheets located at the front, uh, and well, really over at the side, um, of this uh, lecture room uh, with your name, affiliation, and email address um, if you would like to receive more information about future events. Um, I place the, the website for the Thomistic Institute is, is up here on the board. Um, and in addition to the generous support of the Thomistic Institute, we would also like to welcome and thank Dr. Fulvio de Blasi uh, of the Thomas International Center for providing both the video recording and editing of this afternoon's lecture, which will be available on both the websites of the Thomistic Institute and the Thomas International Center. This afternoon, we welcome Dr. Jason Baxter of Wyoming Catholic College, where he serves as an assistant professor of fine arts and humanities. Dr. Baxter's background is in classical philology, literature, and Italian studies. He received his PhD from Notre Dame in 2014 under the joint direction of Stephen Gersh and Vittorio Montemaggi. His dissertation, Two Sacred Encyclopedic Poets, Bernard Salvestris and Dante Alighieri, traces the development of a neglected platonic literary and critical tradition through Macrobius and Bernard Salvestris, which, Dr. Baxter argues, Dante both knew and engaged. He has published on Bernard Salvestris, The Reception of Boethius, and Dante. Over the past year, he's been working on an extensive online course constituting an introduction to Dante over the course of 18 one-hour lectures, available through Wyoming Catholic College's Distance Learning Program. He intends to publish these lectures as an introduction to the Commedia. He is also preparing a scholarly monograph on Dante and encyclopedism. This afternoon, he will be offering a lecture entitled Rewriting Souls, Lexio Divina in Dante's Purgatorio. I am proud to call Dr. Baxter a good friend, and I ask you to join me in welcoming him this afternoon. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm really grateful to, to be here at Duke. Um, I think my experience has kind of been what Dante describes in Paradiso, right? Uh, the soul sort of crowding around and saying, ecco chi... Uh, crescerà li nostri amori. Right? Here is one who has come to increase our love. So it's been really fun. It's great to it's great to participate in this conversation. Um, grateful to Dr. Griffiths for his uh, for his his kind remarks that he'll say when I'm done with this paper. Um, <laughs> I'm just trying to predispose you to. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, the good news is that um, I tried to write this as a lunchtime talk. Um, there's a joke. Um, on page six, so I mean, listen, listen for that. Um, uh, and I also wanted to aim for about 35 minutes because I know everyone has, um, has duties, uh, afternoon duties. So it, it should take about 35 minutes. Um, the basic, my basic kind of insight into this is uh, I think that Dante conflates two different medieval traditions, both of which go by the same name. The name is imitatio, right, imitation. But imitatio in the Middle Ages can refer to what you know, Thomas Akempis describes as imitatio Christi, right? A couple, you know, a couple hundred years later. But it's a kind of moral imitation. It's a kind of deep reading, a religious reading, as Dr. Griffiths would say. Um, it's a reading for transformation. But in the schools of rhetoric, there's also a kind of imitatio in which you imitate an authoritative author and rewrite it so that by sort of you know, building within the footprint of a kind of master, you yourself can achieve that auctoritas. And so I think Dante combines both of these forms of imitatio, what I'm going to call a moral imitatio, a readerly, if I may, imitatio, and then a writerly or rhetorical imitatio, and sort of layers them on top of each other in his purgatorio so that we have souls which are being rewritten by means of their rereading. Um, so it's a kind of a beautiful kind of, you know, um, you know, dense network. I suppose the final thing just to mention is, um, I think this whole sort of process of imitatio is um, a ubiquitous phenomenon in medieval culture. Um, all the great cathedrals are literally rebuilt within the footprints of the existing Romanesque, you know, basilicas which stood before them. So Chartres and Saint-Denis, 
um, are literally, though, say, new sort of new structures are built within the footprint that went before. So this is, I think, the sort of, I think, kind of governing image for a rhetorical imitatio that Dante, among other things, has his souls um, rewrite within these kinds of footprints. So, although the souls in purgatorio are saved, forgiven their sins, they're not yet ready to see God. Their ability to participate in the heavenly community is still limited by the vicious habits they did not devote themselves to reforming in life. Their heads are in the right place, you could say. They desire to see God, and they know a vision of Him will be their final end. But like Manfred in Purgatorio Three, they still have their wounds on them. Their hearts are not there, or more accurately to medieval terminology, their affectus has not yet been kindled. Closing the gap between head knowledge and heart knowledge is a slow process, one which will take time and repetition because these purgatorial souls still have with them their characteristic penchants to their, to their specific negative moral dispositions, which they spent much of their lives rationalizing, as the sinners in hell continue to do. For example, Dante illustrates these earthly dispositions repeatedly throughout purgatorio, often, I think, in almost humorous ways. I think probably Dante's humor is probably... Um, neglected by most of us, beginning with his introduction of Casella. Casella, who seemingly took his time before departing for purgatory, is now partly the cause for the upbraiding of a group in anti-purgatory as spiriti lenti, the slow spirits. Two canti later, Bellacqua is explicitly identified as a soul who has taken up his customary earthly ways. Lo modo usato is, is the term. Among the prideful, Umberto Aldo Brandesco, admit, who admits to having loved the nobility of his family too much in life, introduces himself as born of a great Tuscan, the son of Guglielmo Aldo Brandesco, and then he cannot repress a query to the pilgrim as to whether or not he has heard of his famous family. Right? As if you sort of say, oh, sorry, sorry, just going back to earthly ways, right? He th um, shortly after that, we discover that the envious souls are still prone to take no delight in their neighbor's good. Characteristically, they were offended by the fact that the pilgrim can see them when they are unable to see him. Sapia and Guido del Duca further demonstrate an obsessive curiosity with the pilgrim's ability, as they say, to open his eyes at will. And while Guido del Duca reluctantly tells the pilgrim his name, he is resentful that the pilgrim has not shared his name with him. In other words, they still have a penchant to envy, I think. Other examples could be produced. But in the language of medieval monastic speculation on purgatory, these souls are bony, but yet imperfecti. In Dante's day, the acknowledged experts, the periti or the experti, even if they were too humble to admit it, in the theory and practice of effecting such deep transformation, that is overcoming the gap between head knowledge and heart knowledge, were the monastic spiritual writers. They specialized in constructing exercises which led to this deep transformation. That is, exercises through which souls became capable over time of not just assenting to truth, but to loving it, desiring it, responding with effectus. They were rather like personal trainers, but for the soul. The souls within Purgatorio, then, who were spiritually flabby, must submit themselves to the disciplina or exercitium, which was the hallmark of contemporary monastic spiritual writers. So it's not surprising then to find in Purgatorio a monastic flavor. For example, we find souls fasting, engage in acts of penance, singing hymns, and praying. Here the penitent souls have to submit their identity to a group. They have to wear darkly colored habits. They're trained to think about heaven as the chiostro, or the cloister, where Christ is the abate del collegio, or the abbot of the college. They have to follow a liturgical schedule, and they have to force their voices into unison into the monophonic chants which season the canticle. In this way, Dante's purgatory is very, very much embodies that disciplina claustralis, or that sort of monastic exercise, described by Peter of Sell. Quote, the true religious voluntarily and freely desires regular discipline in order to be tied back from the appetites of the flesh as if by bands, he says. It continues, the bonds of religion are the regular statutes. For example, silence, fasting, seclusion of the cloister, ways of acting which do not attract attention, compassion and fraternal love, paternal reverence, reading and persistent prayer, 
recollection of past evils, fear of death, the fire of purgatory, eternal fire, end quote. So all these, you know, sort of a, a host of different tools that a spiritual advisor could sort of draw from to construct a kind of personalized spiritual exercise program for, uh, for the monks under his charge. But according to the same medieval masters, for example, Peter of Sel and Guigo II, there was one activity which served as a central pillar for this disciplina claustralis, lexio, loosely um, translated as reading. The monastic exercitium too, everywhere in the purgatorio, so everywhere in the purgatorio, this lexio is present. Dante's allusion to effective reading, or, but Dante's allusion to this effective reading or this lexio are easily overshadowed by the vivid descriptions of the, penitent, of the penitent's suffering or the brilliant speeches which occupy the narrative centers of the Canti. Umberto, Odorizzi, Marco Lombardo, Forresi, Guido Guinizelli, and Arnaud Daniel provide such impassioned commentaries on love, freedom, peace, or lyric that we're tempted to forget one of the main activities in which they were engaged in before the pilgrim arrived to speak with them and what they will return to upon his departure. Nevertheless, throughout Purgatorio, we find moral exempla, sculpted, dreamed, seen, heard, or sung, quickly alluded to at the beginning of a canto, or tucked away in a few verses at the end. But with all of these details taken together, it's clear that effective meditation, or lexio, on sacred and secular narratives is an essential part of the purgatorial soul's therapy, complementary to their peculiar modes of suffering. In fact, on occasion, it seems like the penitential activity has been selected precisely to enhance the reading experience. For example, the moral exempla carved into the path of the prideful provide the burdened souls with opportunity to read the exempla of pride and indeed to meditate on them, upon them at great leisure, right? As they inch painstakingly over the carvings with their heads just inches above the ground. Have ample time to you know, try to read these things properly, right? They go over these moral exempla again and again, conducting each time as they circle around a kind of visual meditation on these narratives, analogous to more literary meditations of the souls on other terraces. It's important to point out that all these instances of lexio, including the visual and the auditory, are not meant to convey any new information. They give exempla which every soul, medieval soul, would have heard of in life. They're well-known examples, not recherche literary allusions, which any medieval could have heard in sermons in the street. They're drawn from commonplace books and from commentaries which digest what should really be known about a great text, the medieval equivalent of cleft notes. In this way, we hear echoes of that slow and effective monastic Lexio Divina, because here the souls don't read to discover truth. They read to promote a response to truth with the heart. In Carlo del Corno's words, quote, In this intermediary place, the souls are exhorted and goaded no longer with arguments, given that their metanoia has already taken place, but with examples which sometimes comfort, sometimes terrify, but all of which are directly and efficaciously act on their character. End quote. Your own Paul Griffiths begins his reading, his religious reading, with a particularly beautiful passage, I think, which I first heard of in a talk by David Ford. Griffith says, quote, So far as I can recall, I've always been able to read, to make sense of and be excited by written things. I know, of course, that there was a time when I could not read. It's just that I cannot remember it. But I was never taught and have still not properly learned how to read with careful, slow attentiveness. I guess this was written in 1990, right, Dr. Griffith? So I'm sure he's learned since then. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, with careful, slow attentiveness. It's difficult for me to read with the goal of incorporating what I read, of writing it upon the pages of my memory. I find it hard to read as a lover, to caress, lick, smell, and savor the words on the page, and to return to them ever and again. I read instead mostly as a consumer, someone who wants to extract what is useful or exciting or entertaining from what is read, preferably with dispatch, and then move on to something else. And this is where it gets painful, I think, for everyone in this room. 
My habits of reading are mostly like my... No, not yet. It gets painful in a minute. My habits of reading are mostly like my habits of purchasing, dazzled by the range of things I can buy. I spend all that I can as fast as I can, ecstatic at the excitement of contributing to the market economy and satisfied if I can assure myself of a place in that economy by continued, continuing to produce and consume. Here, here's here's it, it, where it gets good for us. I'm not alone in this condition. Most academic readers are consumerist in their reading habits, and this is because they, like me, have been taught to be so and rewarded for being so. Right? In quote. With some differences, I would say this is a brilliant description of the kind of reading performed by the penitent souls in life. That is the kind of consumerist habit. Thus, as part of their penitential activity in death, they will have to read Griffith's book and understand it. They will have to, or to, to historicize this a bit, um, they will have to learn the secrets of reading which monks in the world of Dante knew. Dante's purgatory, in addition to being the place where according to scholastic theology, man makes satisfaction and pays his debitum to God, is a place of desire, a place where desire plays an important role, where the internal fervor amoris, the heat of love, is cleansed by the external heat of suffering. Thus, I'm interested in how Dante portrays his souls in achieving this purgatio, this cleansing, through the so-called cogitatio cordis, the kind of reasoning of the heart, as Hugh of St. Victor puts it. Purgatorio is a place where sinners learn, among other things, how to read. And this is the secret of how they are rewritten. But before moving to a reading of some important scenes in Dante, in which this effective lexio is present, I'd like to first begin with a panoramic landscape sketch of the role of lexio in late medieval culture. Lexio was a fluid activity which created a spiritual space in which, the interior, which, in which interior transformation could, take, could happen. It was a, quote, a movement of reading into prayer, a movement of reading into prayer, as Duncan Robertson has put it. Like Bernard of Clairvaux, Guigo II, and Anselm, Peter of Sell, for example, likes to use gustatory metaphors for this act of absorbing spiritual nourishment in the act of reading. Lexio is a most, a most rich repast, and souls engaged in it are said to ruminate on the sweetest flowers of sacred scripture. But at the same time that it provides nourishment, lexio is also assidua et intenta cum devotione, that is, assiduous and intense in its devotion. It's a violent process. It, quote, purges our inner depths and amputates our wicked thoughts, says Peter. Thus, the monk's constant meditation in this life on scriptural truths and his possible fate, such as burning in ignis purgatorius, leads to the purgation of the interior parts, and this renders purgatory in the next life unnecessary. Obviously, this is what the souls in purgatory didn't do, and so they have to do it there. The great Carthusian writer, Guigo II, in his book, um, The uh, Scala, Claustralium, or the Scala Paradisi, the latter of monks, also describes this movement of reading into prayer as purgative. He calls it interior purgatio, interior purgation. Interior purgatio is the momentous occasion in which external cleansing, the external cleansing of baptism now culminates in the interior cleansing of the heart. And such purgatio is preparatory for the experience of God the chief aim of spiritual exercises. Guigo describes this experience in overwhelmingly sensual terms and with great rhetorical exuberance. To experience God for Guigo is to have desire inflamed, to be enveloped in the sweet dew of heaven, to be anointed with oil, to have your weary soul refreshed, to have your dry soul revitalized with oil, to have hunger sated, to be made to forget earthly things, to be enlivened, strengthened, and made drunk while still remaining sober. In fact, this experience, experiencia, is the distinguishing characteristic between what he calls the philosophy gentium, or the secular philosophers, and the Christian. For Guigo, both the Christian and the secular philosopher are able to use intellectual powers like cogitatio, cogitation, and even meditatio, to contemplate the excellent of excellence of good things. But secular philosophers, the philosophy gentium, 
lack the, the wisdom, sorry, the spirit of wisdom, which would lead them to smell, taste, feel, and be warmed by an experience of God. The philosophos, then, is not an expert in such matters of reading. Thus, any true program of reading must be directed at such an effective end. And this is, and this is the case in Guigo's four-step program, the rungs of his ladder, which is planted to the ground, but, quote, penetrates the clouds of heaven and explores its secrets. Lexio, so it's a four-step program. One, Lexio attentively takes, you know, takes in Scripture with an expectation that the scriptural word under consideration is sweet and crammed full of meaning. Two, meditatio or meditation seeks out fuller explanation. For example, a verse such as, Blessed are they who are clean in heart, for they will see God. The monk considers each phrase in turn, each word, asking why scripture does not say, Blessed are those who are clean in body. It allows the mind to play freely in search of other scriptural authorities, recalling, for instance, how Psalm 23 says, Only the innocence in hand and heart will see, will ascend to God. Or how the psalmist elsewhere prayed, Cor mundum crean me, create in me a clean heart, O God. Or how Job, quote, made a pact with his eyes. Meditatio then contemplates the awesome promise of the visio dei, the vision of God, which will be given to the pure in heart, and how such a vision will satisfy all desires. And finally, it considers how one can acquire cleanliness of heart. It is this contemplation of the greatness of the promise and the weakness of the soul which leads to the impassioned state of three, oratio, in which the soul acknowledges its inability and pants and thirsts and longs for heavenly things. It longs to know God, to know God no longer in the surface way of the letter, but in the sense of experience. In this state of prayer, increased desire comes, what Guigo calls desiderium amplios, and fire is ignited. In short, this process of meditating on words leads to a point where speech ends. Quote, By words such as these and similar ones, the desire is inflamed. In this way, the soul's affectus is stretched out. End quote. Guigo says that tears are the certain sign that such an effective experience will soon be ex- that such an ineffective encounter will soon be experienced, for they effect the inner washing, the inner purgatio, as he says, "O blessed tears, through which interior blemishes are purged." End quote. In a longer version of this talk, I would turn to talking about Hugh of Saint Victor's discussion of cogitatio cordis, or the sort of meditation of the heart, a form of reading which reads so deep that it culminates in the desire for doing good, akin to how the athlete closes his eyes and practices visualization of an upcoming competition and feels his muscles sort of twitch involuntarily, except it's for, obviously, for, for Hugh, for these kinds of righteous deeds. But for present purposes, let me turn to summing, summing this up. This cogitatio cordis is an effective reading which ends in prayer, or as Leclerc says of Jean of Fécamp, Lire, c'est méditer et c'est prier. To read is both to meditate and to pray. When we turn back to Dante, we note that all of these themes are brought together in Canto 20 of Purgatorio, which gives us precious evidence of the reading habits of purgatorial souls. What Hugh Capet there reveals is that the goal of such literary meditation is to bring the heart to rejoice with alacrity upon hearing the actions of the good and respond with anger upon hearing the actions of evil. After telling his own story, Hugh offers a prophecy in which he likens the besieged pope to Christ being mocked and the reckless contemporary French king to Pilate. The righteous anger he clearly feels so very close to Dante's own voice. O oh my Lord, when shall I be gladdened at the sight of vengeance that is, yet uncon- that is yet concealed, hidden in your mind, makes sweet your wrath, says Hugh, sort of spontaneously, is shaped by biblical passages of longing, for example, in the Psalms. Hugh's biblically molded outcry is a sign that the sin to which he was once prone, the avaricious acquisition of land, is now becoming repulsive to him on a visceral level. For the pilgrim's benefit, then, Hugh then explains the quasi-liturgy in which all the souls in this terrace participate, with a telling metaphor. Hugh explains to the pilgrim the practice of the souls, that the practice of the souls here in this terrace is to recite 
exempla in the manner of a monastic antiphonal chant. They don't just go over and over them again and again. He says, noi repetiam. The story of Pygmalion, Midas, Aachen, Sephira, and Polymnester, but they celebrate, lodiamo, the destruction of Heliodorus, and shout out loud with righteous anger, apostrophizing Crassus and mocking him for his taste of gold. Some souls are loud and some are quiet in their vocalizations of this condemnation. The more passion they feel, though, over the evil, the more their hearts are pricked and goaded to express the affection of righteous ira or joy in the good. Their meditation on the impoverished condition of Mary in the inn leads them to shout out, Dolce Maria! And so they're moved by the exempla of poverty in their meditation to the point that it begins to sort of effectively overflow, right? And they begin to actually address the characters in their speech as if they were actually present. So it sort of overflows into, you know, rhetorical apostrophe. And finally, Hugh says that everyone cries out, secondo la fezion, according to his effectus. That seemingly, the more you meditate, the more the effectus has grown in purgatorio. So this is what I've called the sort of moral imitatio. Um, at this point, I'd like to switch and talk about the role of rhetorical imitatio, particularly as exemplified in Purgatorio 7. Dante's method of composition in Purgatorio 7, where he rewrites Virgil, Cavalcanti, the liturgy, and Sordello, is a perfect example of that medieval rhetorical imitatio, which Douglas Kelly has called, quote, the medieval apprenticeship tradition, where a modern writer, a modernus, writes a text within the authoritative framework provided by a model author. For instance, in the preface to his Saturnalia, which Kelly has argued was a crucial was crucial for medieval literary theory and, theory and practice, Macrobius, obviously a late antique author, describes how, having read through a bunch of Latin and Greek classics, he compiled a compendium for his son's advantage. Macrobius is insistent, however, that the passages he has recorded in his Saturnalia, which are often taken word for word from the original, are not ill-digested bits, but rather digested to form a unified body. Macrobius uses other metaphors besides digestion to describe how he compiled the information gathered from various ancient treatises. He likens them, he likens them say, to a bee who has gathered nectar from a series of flowers, um, to the mixing of a perfume maker, as well as to how individual voices in a chorus mingle. He says, Macrobius says, It's my goal for the present work that it comprise many different disciplines, many lessons, many examples drawn from different periods, but be brought together into a, harmonio, into a harmonious whole." End quote. As mentioned, Kelly argues that Macrobius spelled out for generations of medieval writers, including vernacular writers, how to achieve originality through what he calls conspiracy, that is, the blending together of voices um, say in, a, in a chorus into one flavor, in unum saporum. When we turn back to Dante then, I'm going to skip a little bit here. Oh, I should say one other thing. Um, the other kind of interesting thing is that whereas for us, we find um, copying or imitation a sign of inferiority in an author, medieval authors seem to delight in it. For example, Alan of Lille, the beginning of his Ante Claudiano, says that everyone will rejoice to find the ancient text rewritten, right? as if to, there's a kind of um, aesthetic of the rewritten or an aesthetic of imitatio to discover with delight newness emerging within a familiar context. So, to turn back to Dante, we find that the medieval aesthetic of imitatio, that flash of joy that accompanies the spark of recognition of the old and the new, just a few conti before Dante elaborates description, his Dante's elaborate description of the relief carvings on the terrace of the proud, Sordello had directed Virgil and Dante to the Valley of the Princes, in which this sub, well, in which it's described in this way, quote, gold and fine silver, carmine and leaded white, indigo lignant bright and clear, an emerald after it has just been split, placed in that dell would see their brightness fade against the colors of the grass and flowers, as less is overcome by more. Nature had not only painted there in all her hues, but there the sweetness of a thousand scents was blended into one fragrance, strange and new." End quote. 
On the most literal level, Dante describes this valley as if it were a painted masterpiece of nature, with painted flowers and grass. But the valley outshines the most lustrous substances on earth. Nature then has rewritten the earlier text of earthly life, and now giving the, the brilliant colors of, to earthly gems of purgatorial flowers. And yet there's an even greater feat. Nature has brought together the, all that was spread out and variegated on earth into an aesthetic unity in which the flowers contribute to the single unified fragrance of the whole. Nature then has brought together a number of places on earth, a number of passages, you could say, in order to create a single veil which surpasses, surpasses anything found here. Nature has re rewritten the text herself of her own original draft on earth, practiced, in other words, imitatio, to create a work of originality. Um, I'm going to skip some of the technical details. But the fascinating thing is, in this very place in which Dante is describing how nature rewrote her own passages on earth, Dante is doing the exact same thing on a rhetorical level, in which he has allusions to Virgil, to Guido Cavalcanti, to Sordello, to the liturgy, to other hymns, which he all blends together. So at the very moment he's describing nature's rhetorical imitatio, he's actually practicing it himself, as if to show that he's imitating um, the nature which rewrites. In sum, Dante describes nature as practicing that very imitatio which Macrobius taught to aspiring authors. Macrobius says of the perfume makers that they aim to have one ingredient perceptible, quote, since they aim to blend all the aromatic essences into a single fragrant exhalation, end quote. Sounds like a good Calvin Klein advertisement. <laughs> a fragrant exhalation. A passage which is closely echoed in what Dante says of nature, quote, Sweetness of a thousand scents was blended in one fragrance, strange and new. End quote. Whether Dante knew the Saturnali or not, he seizes the occasion to rewrite the poem of his friend and rival by correcting him with allusions to Virgil and sacred text at the very moment he describes nature's practice of imitatio. Okay, so there you go. That's moral imitatio, that's rhetorical imitatio, and now I'm going to try to bring the two together. We've seen how throughout purgatory the souls accomplish their cleansing through the moral imitatio of exempla from scripture, history, and classical literature. At the same time, the second kind of medieval imitatio also figures in purgatorio, rhetorical imitatio, according to which an author blends an unum saporum into one flavor, the, auc the auctores, the authors he had studied. One of the great passages of Purgatorio in which Dante brings together both of these things is Purgatorio 11, 1 to 24, where the prideful, where the prideful souls recite the Our Father. From this vantage, the vernacularization of the liturgical and biblical prayer is a prime example of literary imitatio. It's a kind of spontaneous rewriting of the prayer with special glosses added for the benefit of prideful souls. But now both gloss and original text have been reincorporated into the text itself. Forty-nine words of the Latin prayer become the Italian prayer of more than 160, as if, the vernac as if in the vernacular the Latin prayer releases its potential energy, like the uncoiling of a compressed spring. The you who art in heaven becomes three whole verses, 11, 1 to, th one to 3, emphasizing God's transcendence. The sanctificator nomen tuum, or hallowed be thy name, is amplified into, quote, Praised be your name and power by every creature, as is fitting, to render thanks for your sweet breath. So when it moves from Latin into Italian, it begins to sort of pick up echoes of Francis's prayer um, hymn to the, uh, all the creatures. The your, uh, let, um, thy kingdom come becomes, quote, May the peace of your kingdom come to us, for we cannot attain it of ourselves if it come not for all our striving. End quote. Emphasizing especially the complete impotence of the prideful to get to the kingdom, to get to the kingdom on their own. And finally the phrase libera nos amalo, deliver us from evil, for the prideful, who spent too much of their time on earth using first person pronouns, now has to become a prayer non per noi, not for us but for those who are left behind. But this spectacular rhetorical imitatio seemingly can only occur because of the practice of the, effect, the effective reading, the moral imitatio of the exempla of the prideful. With their faces hovering just inches above the text they read, 
They study these great examples of pride, and this inspires them with a desire to rewrite a prayer which on earth had been, become all too familiar. But perhaps the single best passage for us to see how all these themes come together are the Conti where the poet describes the terrace, sorry, des- describes the terrace of the gluttonous as Purgatorio 23 and 24. These Conti are replete with biblical allusions. For example, we know that the souls are singing the psalm Labia Mea Domine, appropriate, right? Lord, open my, my lips and I will sing your praise. As well as that there's a tree which, give, which, gives them, which reminds them of Mary's generosity at the wedding banquet the temperance of the ancient Roman matrons, Daniel's preference for wisdom over the Babylonian king's polluted meats, the golden age diet of acorns and water, and the honey and locust eaten by John the Baptist. A second tree provides negative exempla of gluttony, including the spawning of the centaurs and the Hebrews that Gideon did not enlist. At the end of Canto 24, though, we we hear the angel rewriting the beatitude, blessed are those who hunger and thirst, saying this instead, Blessed are they whom grace so much enlightens that appetite fills not their breast with gross desire, but leaves them hungering for what is just. End quote. Thus the souls in this terrace are guided in practicing meditatio, a free associative play which ranges across the whole of scripture and classical literature, looking for analogous passages to bring together, the very method Guigo had recommended for meditating on Beatitude. But also within these Conti, we find that Forese, Forese Donati, Dante's old drinking buddy, is portrayed as, the one who's, as one who's beginning to develop this habit of contemplation. He corrects himself, saying that he should not refer to purgatory as a place of punishment and pain, pena, but rather solazzo, consolation. Furthermore, he seems to be conforming himself to Christ through such meditatio. Forese says that the same desire which caused Christ to shout out on the cross, Eli, allowed as an act of voluntary joyful suffering, is what pulses through the souls here and inspires them to go and listen to the exempla of the tree whose fruit they voluntarily forego. In this way, then, we find Forese consciously practicing an imitatio Christi, reliving Christ's life in his own. But what's more interesting is that Dante describes Forese imitatio as occurring simultaneously with his rewriting. The very soul who is singing Labia Mea Domine is first unrecognized because of what Dante calls, quote, la cangiata labia, or his transformed lips, or his transformed face. His face, like a text, is being rewritten. Indeed, the faces of the gluttonous are texts where one may read, you'll remember, their restored humanity. The pilgrim observes the words omo, etched into the vis- visages of the penitential gluttonous, right? In other words, right, the sort of O formed by the eyes with the, with the M around them. So by becoming gaunt, their humanity is actually beginning to be reread again uh, through the text of their face. In contrast to the indistinguishably fleshy visage of Chaco and the gluttonous in hell. The faces then of those who are imitating moral exempla and conducting meditatio on the biblical passages are being rewritten as, as text which more clearly signify their humanity. And finally, the pilgrim, is dis, the pilgrim is described as experiencing an intense moment of delight when he recognizes in the transformed face, sorry, in the transformed face of Forese, the visage of an old friend that is a text rewrit, re, rewritten. Quote, I never would have known him by his features, but the sound of his voice made plain to me what from his looks had been erased, the spark that relit the memory of his changed feature, and I knew Forese's face. In other words, the kind of, that kind of joy of spark, of the recognition of the new within the old, a sort of literary practice and rhetorical practice of imitatio. I'd like to suggest then that in the face of Forese, we're beginning to see some of that heavenly joy shining through. We're beginning to see, beginning to experience something of the delight of the rewritten text, the new within the old. In this way, throughout Purgatorio, Dante allows his vocabulary for the reading souls and the art of the divine writer to rewrite, to overlap. The same divine fabro, a craftsman, who carved the miraculous images into the marble which Dante sees in Purgatorio 10 who outdid his terrestrial composition in the Valley of Kings, also remakes the souls of purgatory. Or as Forese says, 
all these people who weep while they are singing here are remade holy in thirst and hunger. Our respondent this afternoon is a faculty collaborator, we'll say, with the Thomistic Institute at Duke, Dr. Paul J. Griffiths. Dr. Griffiths is the Warren Chair of Catholic Thought at the Duke Divinity School. His main intellectual interests and topics of publication include post-1950 Catholic philosophical theology, the philosophical and political questions arising from religious diversity, fourth and fifth century African Christian thought, especially that of Augustine, and Gupta period Indian Buddhist thought, especially Yogacara. He has published 10 books as sole author and seven more as co-author or editor. Relevant to our topic this afternoon is Dr. Griffith's Religious Reading, The Place of Reading in the Practice of Religion. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Griffiths. Well, thank you um, to Jason for the paper. Um, I learned a great deal from it. I found it very illuminating. Uh, I'll be very brief. I've got three comments I'd like to make, which are in the form of questions, and I hope we can have um, discussion about, about that. But first, let me say how um, illuminating it was to see the subtlety with which Jason drew the connections between these two kinds of imitatio, the writerly rhetorical imitatio on the one hand, and the readerly or moral imitatio on the other. That was beautifully done, and it's illuminating of Dante's text and practice and helpful to me in understanding Dante. So given that, three brief questions and comments. The first has to do with um, experience, the meaning and place of experience in all this. I think that Jason is quite right to say that the monastic tradition evident in Hugh of St. Victor and Guigo and others, does use language of affectus, the affectiones, when it's progressing up the stages of lectio. That's certainly true. But there's a distinction, I think, that is somewhat, at least in my th way of thinking, obscured in the way that Jason represents this, a distinction that I find important and that I'd like to know what he thinks about and how it relates to Dante. So the distinction is not whether the language of experience is present. The kindling of the heart is certainly affective and experiential language. But rather, whether the process of reading is intended and depicted as intending a strong introspective awareness of the condition of the reader. These seem to me distinct. And I think there's a progress, a development within the Christian tradition that begins to emphasize the latter rather than the former right around this time, around Dante's time, and then issuing, you can see it, for example, in a high and pure form in a text like um, Ignatius of Loyola's Exercises, where not only is there the language of affect and kindling and fire and all that, but there's an intense focus on um, introspectable uh, experience as a good. And it seems to me that Dante is somewhere intermediate in this, and I'd like to hear more about that. I think there's two different senses of experience in play, that is. And I should say normatively that I think the first thing is fine and the second thing isn't fine, and there are reasons for that, but that's a normative judgment. I think that what tends to happen with, I don't know, the 14th century and on is that we start to get overly interested in what it's like introspectively to be us. And that's what begins to happen with these texts like Ignatius. Where Dante is on that spectrum, I don't know, but it's a real question for me. So that's question one about experience. The second question is about Dante's text. And this I find deeply puzzling. Um, so Jason described to us beautifully Dante's own practice of writerly imitatio the way that's done, and the tradition that Dante draws on to do it. And I think that's helpful in illuminating completely right. What I wonder about, though, is what Dante's text prompts us, its readers, to do with it. Here's one way of formulating the question. 
Dante's text is so finely wrought and so self-conscious about its own fine fineness that it may deter readers from using it for writerly imitatio. It's too beautiful, maybe. It dazzles with its own perfection. And then, if that's right, perhaps Dante's own text is hard to use in the way that he uses the texts that precede him. I don't know whether that's right, but I'm often, in reading Dante, overwhelmed with how um, this is unsurpassable, right? You can't, I mean, how could anyone do better? Dante himself seems to think that. You know, he goes on and on about how, you know, Virgil is good, but he's better. Um, and, and he's right. I mean, it, I mean, you know, what can you say? This, is, this seems like the end of the story as far as this kind of thing goes. So there's a real in, there's a question there for me as to whether Dante as himself an item in the Christian archive, whether he can be deployed in the same way and for the same purposes that he deploys the earlier archive. I have no idea what the answer to that is, but it strikes me as a, a useful question, maybe. Um, maybe another way to put it is that Dante dazzles, or at least he dazzles me, and being dazzled, I don't know what to do but sit down and contemplate my own blindness before this. I don't want to do anything with it particularly. So, um, third and very brief thing. Um, I'm interested in hearing more about what reading moral exempla does to those who read them. Certainly, Dante depicts in the Purgatorio the process of reading in this extended sense of reading as transformative, as purgative and transformative and preparatory of the readers for the vision of the Lord. But it's also pretty clear, isn't it, that there have been many readers of Dante, viz. this text, who actually aren't transformed by it, who, um, though they can read it attentively, though they can absorb it, comment upon it, understand how it works, attend to the tropes and the forms and all that, in fact find themselves not morally transformed by it at all. Um, and this is a, an ancient and difficult question, right? Um, the question really is, when does reading depictions of moral exemplarity actually have transformative effects on the reader and when doesn't it? And what makes the difference? And just the fact that they're there doesn't seem enough. I'm guided in this actually by um, John Henry Newman, who early in his career wrote what to me is one of his greatest little works called The Tamworth Reading Room, uh, the topic of which is exactly this. Why doesn't reading good, good books make people good? And he thinks it's obvious that it doesn't, or certainly that it needn't, and usually doesn't. And the question then is why? Um, and it's a good question, and I actually don't fully understand the answer to it. So those are my three comments, and maybe uh, we could have discussion, or I'd be very happy to hear what, uh, what Jason has more to say about them. But I do want to underscore again how illuminating the approach taken in this has been for me, to see these two forms of imitation together. It's great. So thank you very much for that. Right. Yeah, those are great. They're great questions. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just take a shot at it, and then um, it'd be nice to just have some conversation. I guess we're a small enough audience where we, we could just have a chat for a little while. Um, yeah, so I guess maybe to begin with number three, um, when do moral exempla inspire transformation, and, wh and when do they not? Or why doesn't good reading make good people? Um, it seems to me at least part of it is... I think with Dante, right, you have to read, you have to read systematically enough to encounter your own blind spots, right? I mean, not every moral exemplum of negative moral exemplum or every positive moral exemplum will mean much um, to ev you know to everyone. But so it seems like for Dante, right, there's a kind of systematic hole. Um, you read until you realize, uh, ah, that's that's an aspect which um, which pertains to me. 
but in sort of responding to that aspect, say for Dante, right, and responding to, say, you know, temptations to gluttony, right, um, you actually put yourself in the place to recognize that other of these vices apply to you as well. And then so this, this kind of, you know, Matsota writes about this, right, in Dante in the Circle of Knowledge. This is a kind of a sort of necessity of um, the encyclopedic undertaking of Dante's text. Um, and in some sense, moving into an aspect of it reveals, um, say, more of the horizons. The other thing is it seems that, you know, Dante is really keen to, um, I think we can learn something from this, but Dante is really keen to complement almost every classical example with a contemporary one. Now, of course, for us, they're all ancient, and I mean, that's, it's, hard, it's hard to teach this to students and get them as excited. It seems to me the ideal way to teach this book would be to just tell a story of every single one of the 200 characters who appear in the comedy, right? Just tell the story independently of Dante's appearance so that when they came and encountered the character, they would be excited to see that one. I, mean, I always think that, say, the example of, say, of Marco Lombardo in Purgatorio 15 might be the single thing most lost on us, right? But for Dante, right, this is, this is the sort of picture of masculinity from the golden age of knighthood, right? So that whatever he says, you're going to be predisposed to listen to, right? I was thinking it'd be like, you know, you know meet, for a lot of us, say, meeting Clint Eastwood, right, in Purgatory, right? And say, Clint, just, can you just tell me what, you know, what's wrong with the world these days? To which Clint responds, you abuse your freedom. <laughs> Whoa, wow, this is like really deep, Clint, right? I mean, you're just, like, you're just like predisposed, right, to love anything he says. And so I think, you know, in some sense, right, we, that's, of course, lost on us, right? Marco Lombardo's speech about, you know, freedom and so forth, I think really, is, really depends on a lot of sort of knowing the ethos of the character. So that's a historical observation. It seems to me the kind of bigger kind of, um, the question you're driving at, Dr. Griffiths, um, what can that teach us? It seems like, well, there's, there's a necessity to rewrite. There's a necessity to, to read texts which feel urgent. Um, there's a necessity, basically, to, to be up to date. You can't be an antiquarian, um, or you can't be an antiquarian with excitement and energy. And, you know, I think you have to continue to sort of blend, for Dante at least, and I think it's true, the urgent and the contemporary, and ha allow that to redirect your readings when you go back to history to find so it has to be this kind of conversation between antiquity and modernity. And I think that helps, even though I don't think it ultimately, you know, um, it ultimately doesn't solve the problem of our ability to encounter great things and not be transformed. But I think it helps if, if there's a sense of urgency when we return to antiquity, which can, I think can only really be fostered by, um, by having some familiarity, at least with contemporary discourse and questions which occupy us on a daily basis. Um, so... Yeah, um, Dr. Griffith's first question was the meaning and place of experientia and the strong introspective awareness which begins to develop in this era. I think that's right. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Richard Southern says something like, um, in this era, um, man discovered the interior continent and he began moving within to explore it. And Don't we all think he'd much better not have discovered it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I mean, it seems to me that, yeah, obviously it could be, it could be abusive, but it seems, um, I mean, with Dante's sort of vision, right, in the sort of polyphony of Paradiso, is a world of harmony and community and a world of individuality. You know, it's, um, I like to uh, re refer to it, you know, um, Thomas Tallis's um, Spim and Olium, right, is not, it's not a four-part motet like Palestrina would write. It's not a five-part motet. It's a 42-part motet, right? And um, it's extraordinary just to experience it. Um, I actually got to hear it um, in an Oxford chapel, and the, the sort of different units of the choir are spread out um, throughout the choir, the, the monastic choir. And so that you're just sort of being lapped in sort of oceanic sound coming from all directions and all different, you know, all different registers. I think that's Dante's vision of heaven. It's a, it's a million-part motet in which every individual is singing his perfect individuality, um, which is fully linked to, uh, with a kind of solidarity and harmony of heaven. Um, and I do think you're right. I think if, you know, Dr. Fowl made remarks to, to this effect last night, that in an age of pluralism, we might actually lose the gift of harmony because all we have is our individuality. We don't have a kind of system into which we um, fold back up, right? It seems to me, though, I mean, for Guigo, for Guigo, you, you read effectively 
until the point that you have a kind of shipwreck of consciousness in which you realize that this beautiful vision of heaven, how ill and inadequately you equipped you are to have it. And this is when that kind of interiority begins. But for Guigo, right, it's an occasion for longing. It's an occasion for frustration with self, with a kind of, um, you know, what does Aquinas say that anger is the, the, the ability to achieve the difficult good because it can destroy obstacles, right? It seems like for Guigo, right, you know, the occasion of reading about such ineffably beautiful things creates a dissatisfaction with self, which moves you into that state of longing, that oratio. And this is almost sort of establishing a live kind of like download of grace, right? Or, or sort of a, a connection which will ultimately lead to the experiencia of God. I mean, you finally basically read to the point where you, re where you uh, recognize a kind of emptiness which creates the possibility for longing, which for Guigo creates the possibility for transformation. So I guess maybe in Guigo, like, sort of combining that affectivity and that interiority, I, th I, think, it's, I think it's pretty beautiful. Um, and yeah. Paul, uh, Dr. Griffith's second question was, um, how do we read Dante? Um, I think you're right. I think he thought he had shut the book on Italian literature. <laughs> Congratulations. This is the last work of Italian literature you will need. Um, and, you know, historically, I wish, I wish uh, Martin Eisner were here because this is, this is what he does. Historically, right, you know, Italianists talk about the difficulty that Boccaccio and Petrarch and others had after Dante in trying to create, write, you know, authoritative literature after Dante. And they have to do lots of clever things. Like Boccaccio, you know, Boccaccio basically writes a f actually funny comedy, right? Dante's comedy is really not funny at all, right? Um, Boccaccio has to write the funny comedy and thus push sort of Dante out of the way to create some sort of, you know, some space for him to achieve a kind of vernacular authority. Petrarch does similar things. Petrarch's lexicon becomes even more restricted than Dante, it becomes even more aulic, right, um, than Dante's. He sort of sacrifices the encyclopedic nature. But I do think Dante thought that this is, this is all you're going to need. There's that mysterious line which scholars still debate in Paradiso 1, where Dante says that he's writing a book which he hopes will be um, um, followed by migliori voci, better voices. Now, I'm not exactly sure. Italianists think that, you know, Italian, Italianists think that Dante is writing a poem which will be imitated. Hollander thinks that Dante's writing the final poem, and now all you'll have to do is pray. So in other words, the opportunity for writerly imitatio is now shut down by Dante. It's too perfect. Now all you need is readerly imitatio. Um, I think that's probably what Dante thought. Two other observations on that. On the other hand, I think Dante thought that language was constantly changing. And so that there would emerge, and this is Paradiso 26 with Adam, right? There would emerge a new occasion in which there was a new language and a new historical period in which there would need to be a new Dante. Um, you know, working in a new language. Um, and this actually was an interesting, um, this was a challenge, I think, was taken up again and again in literary history to be the new Dante, right? All the way down to Borges. Um, what was my other thought? Oh, and I think just if you tracked all the words like maraviglia and stupore and that sort of thing, all the sort of wonder words in Dante, I think you would describe that, I think you would find that he's doing something what, um, Mary Carruthers describes in her book, The Experience of Beauty in the Middle Ages, um, that, there's, that these sort of, he, he tries to create experiences of extreme wonder. I think Dante would have, I think, I think Dante's you know, readers probably would not have read the comedy to children just for the reason it was just too intense and scary, right? Here's the sort of like, you know, Fantasia, right? Disney's Fantasia, right? You don't show it to kids just because it's too intense, right? It's like in terms of content, it's fine, but it's just too scary. I think Dante's readers would have felt like the flight of Jerrion in Inferno 7, 16 as just completely terrifying. In a world like, say, before DVDs and CGI, right? It's a really frightening passage. It's just too vivid. But I think what Dante does is he continues, sort of sets up these sort of moments of maraviglia or stupor or wonder in which the reader, and oftentimes he ends exactly at these moments, right at the end of a canto. Um, and and we, seemingly Dante published these things serially in little groups of Kanti. As if you sort of just finished the fight of Jerry and are just waiting in absolute suspense for how this thing is going to continue. Um, and so I think Dante does this all in a kind of way of, um, a, you know, aimed at the effectus. Here's something which achieves a kind of linguistic violence, which shocks and shatters and opens up. 
And then, with the sort of warmth of the experience, the coldness of the heart begins to melt, and then it can be reforged into something greater.